Good morning, everybody. Do me a favor. If you all want to open up to 1 Kings 18 and earmark verse 20 in 1 Kings 18. I'm going to be jumping around a little bit, but for the sake of your all's time and sanity and to maybe save you a few paper cuts, you all can just feel free to hang out there because I'll tell you everywhere else that I'm reading from. And so, like, uh, Jimmy teed it up for us last week by talking about the words hanging on these banners. And like David just explained, at some point you might have noticed a while back, the banners on the stage just changed. And now there are new words on them. And uh, this is the time that the leadership is set aside to really start dissecting that, to provide you um, as, a, as a leadership body to hopefully say, hey, here are some simple principles that maybe can provide a sense of momentum and structure to faith, because it's kind of a really abstract, wobbly concept of, okay, now that I believe, what do I do? And so hopefully the, the words up here can be a pretty intuitive way of growing in faith. So this morning, we're going to start with worship. And so a few weeks back, with me being the worship pastor, David asked me, can you preach on worship? And so in order for us to really unpack what all worship is, it seems like there are three overall questions that we're going to have to answer. And the first one is going to be, hey, uh, why, why exactly are we worshiping in the first place? And this one's probably about the simplest one to answer, but in order to help give us an answer, I'm going to be reading from Romans chapter 8. And in verse 21, it says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will, he not, how will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And who could possibly condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall, who shall separate us from the love of God and of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For it's written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So whenever we are confronted with the question of why exactly are we worshiping, we're worshiping because of God's great love. Right. Because for some inexplicable reason, the God of the universe has decided to look on people who have nothing truly to offer him and say, I want to be with you and provide the way to be with us through his son to make coverage for sin and to remember them no more. And to be his people where once we weren't. And then to be able to have rest knowing that there's nothing that could possibly separate us from that love once we follow him. That's why we worship. And I, I could easily spend the whole sermon on that passage. And so if that... 
if you're still trying to wrestle with just that first bit, then come grab me or David or Adam or Carrie or Tisha or anybody uh, who would love to talk to you more about just that. If, if, if even that you're still trying to wrestle with. But that's why we're worshiping. So now in order to, for the sake of time, get to the next question, uh, what exactly is worship? And uh, David cracked this joke the other morning at the shepherding meeting, and I had contemplated doing it of, uh, before he even cracked the joke of like showing pictures of, you know, like the, the varying degrees of like uh, of of what people do whenever they worship, you know. So it's like if you're the new guy at church, then you you worship like this, and you kind of mumble sing. And then if you're like, you know, if you're comfortable, then maybe you kind of have your hands on the back of the seats in front of you. And then if you're doing the kind of Baptisty thing, you might occasionally say something like "Yeah" or "Amen," and then you kind of half raise your hand. And then if you're like the more charismatic Pentecostally flavor. You got both hands up and you're probably singing the loudest. Um, and then there are other flavors of worship where people wave around incense and people sing all in unison liturgy that's been passed down for thousands of years. And there's their own beauty in that. And then I could have, you know, totally blindsided you with pictures of people in third world countries uh, slaughtering goats. You know, uh, the example David brought up was that famous picture of the monk dude who just set himself on fire in protest. Because we get so uh, locked into our particular idea of what worship is, it's kind of easy to forget that the whole singing thing is um, kind of recent. So, okay, then what specifically is worship. And so that's where we're going to get to 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 20. And I am, a, I got a couple of expensive pieces of paper that say I'm a Bible nerd. And so I really, and I particularly love the Old Testament because there are uh, a, a rich abundance of just bizarre stories. And even though they're not necessarily about us or written specifically to you, because God just had to hand you a personal letter in 2023, but still they're written in such a way that God is trying to give you some sort of principle that you can find yourself somewhere in this text and really resonate with it. So we're going to read the story, and I'm certain you all have heard this story several times. And while I'm reading it, hopefully you can kind of f try to find yourself in there. I'll let you know where you are by the end of it. But at the very least, as we're going along, try to find yourself in there. And to give you a little bit of context, we're going to be reading about Elijah. Now, Elijah was a prophet who had one very good talent, which was to really annoy the king. And in particular, the king's wife, who really did not like him. And uh, for any of you all, I'm certain the vast bulk of you know this, if you irritate somebody's wife, you have now bonafiably irritated them. It, there's a distinct transient property. If you annoy my wife, you annoy me by default. So, especially whenever the queen is very good at killing prophets and he's irksome, he's in an intriguing situation here. But Ahab, who's the current king of Israel, who keeps oscillating back and forth of are we going to worship God or are we not? Are we going to worship the pagan deities or this or that or whatever? Finally, Elijah just stands up and just says, hey, it's time to stop fence sitting and pick a side. So it says this starting in verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? Is Yahweh God that you will follow him? Or is Baal that you would follow him? And the people did not answer Elijah a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even only I, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 strong. Let two bulls be given to us and let them choose 
one bull for themselves and cut it to pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I'll call upon the name of Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. For you are many and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to the offering. And they took the bull that was given and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and nobody answered them. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry a little louder, for he's a god. Maybe he's amusing himself, or maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's out on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep, and you just need to wake him up. And they cried aloud, and cut themselves, as was their custom, with swords and lances, until the blood gushed out. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation had passed. But there was no voice. No one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near me. All the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of Yahweh that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of Yahweh had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of Yahweh. And he made a trench around that altar, as great as contain two seahs of seed, so about seven and a half liters or so of material. And he put the wood, and he put on he put on the wood in order to cut the bull into pieces, and then he laid those pieces on to the wood. And he said, "Fill four jars with water, and now pour it onto the burnt offering, and onto the wood." And then he said, do it a second time. And so they did it a second time. And he said to them, do it yet a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran over the altar, and it even filled the trench with water. And at that time, the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned back their hearts. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed and burned the offering and the wood and the stones and the very dust around the altar. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And... You might be trying to figure out where exactly you fit into this whole thing. Now, everybody, everybody loves stories. Like, every culture loves stories. We all have stories. And they're just fun. They're a wonderful way to just sort of get lost for a while and to uh, relate or empathize with somebody else and be just transported out of your cares and your worries for a little bit. And just be entertained by something and and good fun. And so whenever you try to find yourself in there somewhere, it's our tendency to really want to connect with a protagonist. 
And there's something kind of awesome about amuse, like just kind of getting lost in the thought of maybe whenever literally everybody else stands up and says, no, God isn't God. I could be that one man who holds the line and says, no, and then fire falls down and something epic happens. I don't mean to burst your bubble in the story. You're not Elijah. And maybe you're a little hard on yourself, so maybe you're on the opposite end of things, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of a ruddy person. I kind of fence it. I, I, I don't have my stuff figured out. Uh, don't be quite so hard on yourself. I don't think you all are, uh, there's no excuse for any sin, but I, on, on the grand scheme of things, I, I doubt you're the king who okayed the murder of hundreds of prophets. Don't be quite so hard on yourself because you're not Ahab, you're not these prophets. So if you're not Elijah and you're not these prophets, then where specifically should you find yourself in this story? Interestingly enough, uh, where we should resonate with is your life, my life, we're actually one of these two bulls. And you're wondering, what on earth, how do I relate to a bull that got slaughtered and stuck up on top of a pyre? What on earth does that mean? So for that, I'm going to read for you all something out of Romans 12. Because here in Romans 12, at verse 1, Paul answers for us what exactly worship is and how we should find ourselves in the story of these two bulls. And it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I'm reading from the ESV, so it says spiritual worship. Uh, Some of you all might have other translations. As much as I love the ESV, this isn't the best way of saying this because the Greek word there is actually logikos. What does that sound like? Logic. The better way of translating it, which some of your Bibles probably say, is this is your reasonable worship. Worship, it seems rather than just an act of singing before a sermon to kind of focus us and prepare us for whatever it is God might have to say to us that morning, as Paul is saying here, looks an awful lot more like a holistic life posture. That your whole life is an offering, and by extension, that offering throughout your life is your worship. There's nothing that you can do that isn't somehow, some way, a form of worship. And yes, in some way, you can connect to the other characters in the Elijah story. But for the sake of worship, you, we need to understand that your life communicate some sort of message, just like these two bulls. And your life is either an offering to useless things where there's going to be no answer to you, or your life is going to be an offering to God. And he can do awesome things with it. Because that's your reasonable act of worship. And then by response, whenever other people see what's happening with you, they have no other response but to say, well, that must be God. Because truthfully, I don't know what I would do either if some guy just came up and said, hey, I'm going to pray over this bull and call to my deity and fire fell from the sky. And the bull and the altar and everything that was just there is now not. Even the dirt is just gone. You're just like, yeah, I guess that's God. What else do you do? And that's all the people could say is, yep, that, that's God. We're, we're just, okay, we're going we're gonna to kneel here and we're going to start to worship now because what else do you do? That's the reasonable response. 
And there's really, ultimately, nothing that we do that isn't some form of worship. So over in Colossians 3, and to a different church, Paul wrote that whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And if you want to get even more nitty gritty over in 1 Corinthians when talking about meat sacrificed to idols, Paul got even more technical and tells them in everything that you eat or that you drink, give glory to Jesus. And if you still don't believe me, it seems like the linchpin might be in Romans 14 where Paul says, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Quite literally everything you do with your time, your life, is an act of worship. The question is, worship to what? And the whole... And this is where it gets kind of vague again. It gets kind of nebulous. It's kind of like just saying, well, just do better. You're like, okay, um, what, what exactly does that look like? And what does it look like to eat or drink something in faith? What does it look like for every, I mean, we, we kind of get word or deed. You know, you don't want to say uh, foolish or dumb things that reflect poorly upon yourself and your loved ones and God. You don't want to hurt people with your words, your deeds. That makes sense. I, I don't want to just slap somebody across the face. That's not super loving. I mean, so those kind of make sense for you. Like, but even what I eat or, or drink, how? And, you know, we kind of get, there's a bit of intuitiveness there too, because you're like, well, I don't want to eat or drink things that are bad for me. Or I, I, I don't want to intake things that yeah, get me some form of inebriated where the spirit is no longer in control of me. I, I just, what, how do I, do, what? Like, how do I eat an omelet to the glory of Jesus? How do I watch television to the glory of Jesus? Because then things start to feel a little stodgy and, and frankly, a tad unrealistic. Okay? I had a professor in Hannibal, and, and for this, because he was, he was a very, he's a very popular celebrity preacher, so I'm not going to rag on the guy because he does awesome work. Um, one of my professors went to breakfast with one of the presidents of one of the seminaries and the celebrity preacher and the celebrity preacher's 16 year old son and this seminary president kind of a tucked in shirt stodgy not much sense of humor kind of guy so if he's making small talk with you the man was really trying i mean really going out of his way to try and he looks at at the celebrity preacher's 16 year old son who's clearly bored out of his gourd with this conversation amongst all these PhDs who are sitting here talking about random things. He try he gives the kid an olive branch and knows you just got your driver's license. That must be exciting. And suddenly the celebrity preacher reaches his hand over and says, let's not talk about that. We're talking about the things of God. <laughs> ah, that's kind of a buzzkill. <laughs> And yet, whenever we're told that literally everything we do must bring glory to God, that's where we feel like we're very quickly headed. That faith very quickly just becomes this big, long list of of no-no things. You don't do this. You don't do that. Uh, everything must be with uh, with on bended knee, with shaven head, ashes crawling on cobblestone, praying for five hours a day, because that's the only way to really worship, right? Everything has to be that. You are not allowed to have a movie that's your favorite that is not The Passion of the Christ or one of the the, the fireproof folks. Them. And if it is bad. And Chosen is the only TV show you're allowed to watch. That and VeggieTales. <laughs> so pick your poison. And those things begin to feel very harsh and cold and unrealistic. So how exactly do we worship God in all of these things? And I feel like Jesus tells us this. And first of all, we, we can have a sigh of relief because uh, in, in John, Jesus gives us a very simple 
bit that's truly profound, but it's just this passing statement, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So we know that Jesus hasn't come uh, to take away all the fun out of your life because he says, I'm here to show you how to actually live. But in Matthew chapter 11, we get this interesting thing. And I'm certain you all have heard the first verse, but the following verses are what make it even more compelling. In chapter 11, verse 28 of Matthew, Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's very nice. That's very comforting. We like, we like rest, Jesus. But what makes the verse compelling is where he immediately says, Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And we have an immediate paradox of what Jesus is saying. He says, I'm here to give you rest. Well, how do you give me rest, Jesus? If you don't know what a yoke is, it's a hunk of wood that goes around the neck of a bull, an ox, or a donkey, or a horse, or something along those lines. And it's meant for you to haul a heavy load. It's a device of labor. So Jesus gives it a little bait and switch, huh? So then I'm going to give you rest. Take my job. And it's intriguing. And then he says, now learn from me as I wear it. He says, understand that I'm gentle. Like, but still, Jesus, uh, this labor is the opposite of rest. But he assures you that if you learn from him, he says, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's something about the labor in and of itself that is the rest. And that seems a bit unintuitive because we here in America, we really like our rest. I'm a, I can be a very, very lazy person if I let myself be. And, I, and especially because of streaming services now, people have, we have now tapped into unrealized depths of laziness. Television shows that took me three years to watch back in the day, I can now watch in two and a half days and not move. It's incredible. Like, we have somehow created the ultimate tool of laziness. I don't understand what happened to us. If there's a way we could, like, swap that, we could solve all the world's energy crisis. Like, maybe if I just binge on a hamster wheel or something, I don't know. Uh, but the rest in and of itself is the work and as we would find out later this yoke that Jesus bears and then tells people to bear with him he then distinctly stops mincing words and calls the yoke the cross and says if you're going to follow me you're going to have to carry it You're going to have to carry it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts around it. And carrying it is the act of worship. And it is rest. It's not about sanitizing your life to where everything is literally PG, but you can't, you can't be those kinds of PG because those kinds of PG have social messaging we don't like, so then we're going to get into even more very specific PG, and then we're going to do this. It's not about sanitizing you or insulating you or making you the bubble boy of, of Team Jesus. It's about understanding that your life is always on an altar. And quite literally everything you do is worship. And the thing that suddenly takes it from being a hedonistic, pointless action that just keeps you alive till the next day, and then it actually being a meaningful act of worship is 
faith. Now, somebody, I don't, I don't know, maybe some trained chef out there who doesn't really know Jesus might want to fight me on this. Fine, I'll fight back. I think that because I genuinely know Christ, and because I can actually eat a piece of like chocolate cake, I'm a chubby kid at heart. I've been chubby my whole life. Cake is a vice. I, I can take that and eat that and actually have a genuinely deeper, more joyful, meaningful experience by eating this and thinking, this is awesome. And life is good. And God is good. Then somebody who's just like, yeah, that's good cake. That might seem kind of arbitrary, but if you begin to pull this out into everything, it suddenly becomes incredibly meaningful. Because now all these barriers in your life of what's secular and what's sacred seem to drop away, and everything seems to look an awful lot like what Jesus said. There's a field out there, and I'm here that you can learn how to live. Now go work the field. Everything begins to look like that when you stop trying to sanitize everything and just understand that my whole life is worship. Everything from the way I enjoy my food. Am I eating a bunch of things that are slowly killing me? Am I being hedonistic and I making food into an idol? Whenever I was like this tall in this round, I clearly made food an idol. And I have... I, I have to have a very careful kind of relationship with food in my life where it quickly becomes a sinful thing because I'm not eating it in faith. I'm eating it because I'm bored or because I'm uncomfortable or because I'm upset and it's something I can control and it gives me a pleasant little dopamine rush to eat something sugary that's going to inevitably kill me if I keep eating it at that point. There's a way to consume things to where it becomes immediately unhealthy. There's a way to enjoy art in a way that it becomes immediately unhealthy. There's a way to enjoy your family to where it becomes unhealthy, to enjoy your phone to where it becomes unhealthy. But if everything then starts looking an awful lot like worship, how do I interact with things in faith? Then suddenly everything is cleansed and purified. And that's tricky, and that's hard. I understand. I can't tell you all the ins and outs of what that looks like for you all, because your all's life is different than mine. Maybe you all don't have a sinful relationship with cake like I do. But when, whenever we do things in faith, it doesn't look like being the buzzkill who says, we're not talking about the exciting thing in the 16-year-old's life because that's not under the glory of God or, or whatever. We're saying, how do I give thankfulness and then interact with this in a way where I still have my Savior in mind? Because he wants you to enjoy the good things in life. God, there's no logical reason for why food tastes good. If you're just a blob of meat that accidentally came out of a puddle because lightning hit it or whatever, and all you need to do is stay alive and make babies, there's no reason for food to taste awesome. There's no reason for you to get something out of art. There's no reason that the process of making said babies is awesome. You're just supposed to stay alive. And yet God gave you these things to enjoy them. So clearly you're meant to enjoy your life. It's not about being a stick in the mud. It's about doing things in faith with Christ in mind. And here's the thing. Whenever we go back to Elijah, in case you couldn't tell, Elijah is a bit of a showboater. He deliberately made scenarios in which something horrible would be happening. And then that horrible thing would somehow give glory to God. So whenever he sets up the scenario of, hey, we're going to build two altars and you all get to pick your own bull. Here's an interesting thing about paganism or about animal sacrifices generally. You pick a good animal to give to the god. You don't give them the scrawny little dying sickly thing. There were even rules in Leviticus about how you don't give sick animals to God. You give them the good one. So whenever he says, you all, Go pick out some bulls and we'll put 
the gods to the test and see who's God. I'm certain that whenever he told the Baal prophets, go pick yours, they picked the fattiest, just meatiest bull they could find. I mean, they stuck like all the good hunks of meat on the altar. They doused that thing and really good smelling oil. They did everything they could to make this the picture perfect representation of an offering. And the text doesn't say this, but Elijah is a showboater throughout his entire ministry. So I would be willing to kind of wager that whenever he gets, whenever they get an offering, he just got an okay bull. He deliberately was like, that bull do. They're like, there's a better one over there. No, that bull do. Trust me, it'll be fine. And he just grabs a normal looking bull. It's healthy, but it's just normal. And whenever he sticks it on the altar, he then proceeds to ruin the... He, first of all, builds the, his own altar by just gathering up some rocks. It doesn't say he went on a laborious journey for all the rocks. He just gathered rocks that were there. They could have just been okay rocks. I, I, don't, I don't never built an altar, so I can't tell you what the good altar rocks are, but... And instead of covering the bull in oil, which you're supposed to do because it makes the offering smell nice, it makes the God want to, to eat the food, he covers the whole thing in water. If you've ever cooked, you'll understand something. Flesh doesn't like to burn. So you use an accelerant, like oil, to cook it. And he covers it in water. This thing is not going to catch on fire. It's a lousy offering. It's no good to anyone. But Elijah comes up and just says a word in faith. I know this is pleasing to you. And fire falls from heaven and takes the lousy offering. And what makes the offering something that gives glory to Christ instead of being just a lousy offering was the faith in which it was presented to God. Because here's the thing, your life, my life, trust me, I know about my life, they're lousy offerings. And even if you got some cool stuff in your life, what exactly do you give to a God who literally just spoke all of the matter of the universe into existence? If you got nothing to hand him. And it's interesting because all throughout scripture, it doesn't seem to be about the quality of the offering. Like you need to be afraid about the quality of the offering. It seems to be that what makes the offering truly glorious is, are you giving it in good conscience and good faith? Are you concealing anything from God or are you giving all of the offering that you have to give? And we even see an axe in chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira tried to hold something back from God. It wasn't pleasing to him. All throughout the Old Testament, whenever people try to hold something back from God, he hates their worship. He explicitly tells them, I hate that. That doesn't bring glory to me. And yet, in the New Testament, whenever we see a little old woman come up and just give two copper pieces, Christ says, that's the greatest faith I've seen all day. Two copper pieces is a lousy offering that's not going to keep the entire temple complex, which in Jesus' day was massive. It was a humongous compound. It's not going to keep all of those people employed and keep the grounds of that place looking nice. But that woman gave what she had in faith. And we can do that with the little parts and pieces of our lives. And say, how can I take this part of my life and make it into an act of worship or make it into an offering? I know it's lousy, but if, maybe if I do it in faith, it can be pleasing to him. So, um, all through, all throughout my faith journey, I haven't been particularly good at prayer. 
I just haven't been. Like, I'll pray with people. Like, when I'm praying, I'm praying. I'm there. You've got me. Um, I'm just, I was never, I've never been very good at making sure, hey, I got X amount of time in the day where it's just me alone with God to pray, to either give some sort of petition to him or to just talk to him or just something. I've never been good at that. And it's mostly because I spend too much time in my head. Um, I'll just have one random thought and then I accidentally make like three different rabbit trails. And then I follow one rabbit trail all the way to the end. And then I come back and follow the next one. And then I come back. And like 20 minutes go by. And I'll be sitting there realizing, oh, I was praying like 20 minutes ago, wasn't I? And I would just get so angry and flustered, I would just give up and stop praying. And it was just just incredibly difficult for me. Um, And here's the thing. So I brought this. And this is a thing I bought in April of 2022. I know that because I bought it at the same weekend as my sister-in-law's wedding because um, we just happened to walk into a CVS and I saw it, so I bought it. Um, this more or less turned into how I prayed because uh, I can't concentrate because I get lost in my own thoughts. So I thought, well, what happens if I try writing them out? Here's the thing. I, I hate journaling. I hate it. I know what I'm thinking. Why do I need to write it? I've never understood journaling. Uh, so, so it took me a minute. And it's not journaling. It's legitimately, this is just how I pray some days. If I know I can't concentrate. There are some days where, not, where I know I'm locked in and I'll pray and it's fine. And then there are other days where I just, I, I have to write it. I have to write it all out, long form. Some days are bullet points. It just comes and goes. And here's the thing. Um, I'm still not very good at this. But I knew, especially whenever I got... <laughs> Whenever you all made me worship pastor, something had to change. I just couldn't be the guy who doesn't pray anymore. So uh, what do we do? And from the beginning of April, minus a few days, and so the end of December, I I counted up all the days. And oh my goodness, this is lousy. Um, Out of all the days available, I prayed two-thirds of the time. I missed a lot of days. Either because I left my prayer book out of sight, so it was out of mind. Like, if it's, if it's not in front of me, if it's not on a sticky note, I'm going to forget it. I can li- you can tell me something to my face. I need eggs, milk, and butter. I'll say eggs, milk, and butter, eggs, milk, and butter, eggs, milk, and then I walk into the grocery store. I'm like, what am I buying? So it's not even just like I hate praying. It's just, I just, it's not a discipline. Uh, so this, especially for a guy who's, this is part of my job, um, this is kind of lousy. But the hope isn't that I suddenly become the person who can pray for three hours on bended knee, weeping with my head shaved and, and everything else. The hope is that I would say, okay, how do I take something in my life and try to offer it to you a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more because 62% is a lousy number, uh, which is not even quite two thirds of the time. Um, But it's easily like 10 times more than what I was praying before. And so for me, that's a tad embarrassing and it's kind of a, it's like I said, it's not a very good offering. Um, But I'm trusting that because I did this in faith, because he told me, if you spend time with me, your life will be better, that this is pleasing. Hopefully. And I believe it is. And we can do that with the things in our life. But it's not about being the stick in the mud who overly sanitizes everything because that's what Christian people do, right? It's taking the bits of your life one bit at a time as the Spirit shows them to you saying, hey, let's do a little work here. And so you act there in faith. And then once that's good, you move on and you say, hey, you act there in faith. And the best part is if you hit a wall, you can't get over it, then you've got other people here who can help you get over it. Because sometimes there are things you're not going to be able to get through alone. And you need help. So maybe 
it's, it's like me and you got this sinful relationship with food and you're like, I, I can't, I can't keep my discipline with it. So then you confess that to another person and say, help me. There's nothing particularly splendid about confessing what you did wrong. It's like, duh, you shouldn't shovel cake into your face all the time, man. What's so glorious about the fact that you confessed up to that? The thing is, is that you confessing to something isn't about relieving your conscience or it's not the next hurdle you have to jump over. It's the fact that you found an area in your life where the Spirit was talking to you and you were sensitive enough and obedient enough to say, I have to confess this to somebody else. And that in and of itself is an offering that's pleasing. And having somebody else there to help you go over the hurdle in faith is something that's pleasing. It's about doing that with life. Just be sensitive to the Spirit. And whenever He shows you something that you're not being faithful with, then let God work that out in you. And let Him sanctify it. Because things will get better. And it's all right. If you do it in faith and good conscience, He's pleased. And it seems counterintuitive to us, and, and I get it because this is very counter, counterintuitive to me, um, that 62% of the time would be something that's pleasing. And sometimes people just need to hear this out loud. I'm not making excuses for sins or shortcomings in our life. I just sometimes we all need to hear this out loud. Um, you're not surprising God by your sins and shortcomings, even the ones that you're deliberately still struggling with. And there's not an excuse for them. We need to work them out. Uh, but understand, um, God's not angry at you. And Christ bears the yoke with you. And what makes the labor rest for your soul isn't the fact that finally I'm doing work that I enjoy. No, it's um, Christ isn't lording himself over you. And he's in the process of sanctification with you. That's the rest. He's changing you to be like him. You're learning from him the Spirit is forming you to be like Him. The work is the rest. And your life is your worship. So then the last thing we got to figure out is, well, then why exactly? Uh, if my life is worship, and worship isn't necessarily the sing-songy bit of the service, uh, then why exactly... Is the guy up on the stage called the worship pastor, and why is his job to sing? Well, more specifically, that, that part of worship, some people specifically call it praise and worship. Whenever we sing praises to God, aside from the fact that we're being obedient when we sing, because God gives umpteen Julian commands all throughout Scripture to sing to the Lord. And there's all these fun little psychological... Like you could find, I don't even know how many articles about the psychological ins and outs of singing. There's intuitively something very deeply spiritual about singing. And it resonates with people a lot more. It's like a very primal thing. I t Here's the thing. All the other people in the shepherding group like to pretend I'm the uber language guy. I'm really fascinated by Hebrew. I keep Greek several arm's lengths away because it's silly and makes no sense. And uh, they always look at me like, Nathan probably already knew that. Oh my God, Nathan did not already know that. Uh, but what's interesting is when I took Greek and Hebrew a long time ago, I still have the Hebrew alphabet memorized because our professor made us sing it to the melody of uh, Yankee Doodle. And he hated music, but he said, you will have it memorized by the end of the semester if I make you sing this every day. I still remember that. I know how to pronounce Greek words when I see them. I, I can't remember the names of the letters anymore. This one might hit a little bit close to home. Uh, let's say you're an eligible young bachelorette and a dirty man comes up to you with torn jeans, makes minimum wage, has no plans for his life and professes his love to you. You're going to say, get out of here. And your dad will say to him, get out of here. Uh, the moment that dirty man comes up to you and professes his love to you with a guitar, she's gone. <laughs> 
It's, there's, I learned this very quickly as the unattractive, slightly chubby dude in high school. There's something magical about the string box and people like you. <laughs> people over there are chuckling at me. <laughs> um, there's, we understand there's something very intuitive and deeply spiritual about music. It resonates with us. But during the service, it's something even small that we can give back to have a tangible, active part in our worship. To say, hey, together, corporately, we can't always be with each other throughout all of our bits of sanctification. We can't always be with each other during the hard bits of life. There's too many people in this room for me to always be with you praying all the time and giving our lives together in that capacity in worship. But whenever we're all here and we're all singing and we're all proclaiming the same things that are on the screen because we look at these and we say, these things tell you about the glory and the nature of God. And I worship this God because he loves me and nothing can separate me from him and my life is worship to him. We're singing together because that is our offering in these times of worship. Yes, it can get us locked in and it does help us focus. But that's something that we're giving back in the time that we gather together to be as one. There's an opportunity for us to not just be consumers and give something to God in our worship. And so whenever we sing, really sing. And some days it's harder to sing than others. Because stuff's going on. And you don't have to be the loudest, beltiest, most wonderful singer out there. I know plenty of people who worshiped their whole heart out. And they were really tone deaf. But that person's giving an offering in faith. And on the days where you don't feel like singing, still sing. You don't need to feel any particular way to give a pleasing offering to the Lord. You just need to do it in faith. Because there are still a lot of days where I really don't feel like praying. But i got to write it down anyways. So whenever we sing, especially in response, because the band can feel free to come back up. Take that in. I really start to digest that about what it is for your whole life, literally all of it, to be worship. It's worship to something. So is it worship to you and your hedonistic sensibilities and this and that and just you loving art or film or books or television or your kids or your electronic devices for the sake of just loving them because you like them or is it somehow, some way, something you can offer in faith? And be sensitive to the Spirit whenever He brings something up in your life and says, Hey, this isn't worshiping me. How do we how do we change this? And maybe it's just a change in your mindset, and that's all it is. But maybe sometimes it's a little bit more pernicious and it's a particular vice, and you have to put up extra buffers in your life, and you have to do the embarrassing thing and confess some hard sins to people. It's okay. He's guiding you to genuine worship so that your life is a pleasing offering. So I'm going to go back and read that a bit again from uh, Colossians. I'm going to read the verse prior to it as well. So this is Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all worship, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So in this time of response, be sensitive to what you're not worshiping with, and let's worship. And maybe things are all right, and so you're just going to sing praises. Awesome. Because we'll sing them together, and we'll sing them in good conscience and faith, and it'll be pleasing to God. So let's sing together.
I'm going to pray over you all real quick. Father God, we thank you for this morning, for this time that we had to gather together and examine how it is we should worship and why we should worship and what it is to really, really worship. And I pray this morning that when we sing, we could sing wholeheartedly and faithfully even if it's hard to sing, even if we don't feel like singing, that we would praise you, and that would be an offering of worship. That when we go to work the next week, whether we enjoy our job, whether we hate our job, we work diligently because you've asked us to, and that would be an offering of worship. When we interact with our family members, be they spouses or children or siblings or in-laws, that we would treat them lovingly, because that's an act of worship, that everything in our lives, that, your, that you, Spirit, would muster up everything in us and show us how we could be worshiping. And let us be a people of boldness and courage and also humility, enough humility to offer those to you in faithfulness to know that you'll sanctify us, but that we could also rest in your son knowing that his yoke is easy and his burden is light and that you don't lord these things over us but you do them because you love us and you want us to have life and that maybe through our simple acts of worship and our crummy offerings you could be glorified and other people would be saved let's go this in Jesus name Amen